Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Curatorially Speaking. I am your host Oluwa Shayo Oluwa K. And today I am joined by a very special guest, someone I followed her work for some time. It's the non- none other than the wonderful Tandiwe Moreo. Tandiwe, hello. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. I'm very excited to be here. Oh, that's great. That's great. So I remember scrolling on Instagram one day and I saw this very bright fabric and it kind of caught my attention. And then I saw this beautiful black model. And then I was like, okay, who is this? I need to find this artist. I need to know who they are. I just need to follow their work. And then I stumbled on your page and I started following you since then. (laughs) And so like, I think that leads me to my first question. What is the origin story of your style of photography um, and how did you come about using like fabrics that is a very long story it's a story of my life but to summarize it i think it's um my background is i was born and raised in nairobi kenya and i only have sisters and how i was raised is of course um in in african culture i think across the continent It can be very traditional and it's most traditional form. There are roles reserved for men and roles reserved for women. And women are told there's things you can do and there's things that you leave for the men to do. But I'm very thankful that um, my father never raised us that way. And he always told us, you can do anything you want uh, with enough hard work and research, you can do it. And so he taught us to do all sorts of things and never kind of taught my sisters and I the boundaries between these are masculine things and these are feminine things. And, you know, if they're masculine, you don't do them. And so fast forward many years later, um, I realized I was in love with photography after my dad introduced me to to a camera when I was 14 years old. And I I realized I was very passionate about creating stories. So I didn't want to be a journalist. I wanted to create all these amazing worlds that you see in fashion magazines or in advertisements. I didn't want to record. I wanted to create. And so I kind of ended up in commercial photography as one of the very few women in commercial photography in Kenya. And so I'm kind of doing my dream job and thinking, oh my gosh, this is it. I've made it in life. (laughs) And I realized that I wasn't feeling very fulfilled as an artist. And I kept thinking, what is wrong with me? Why, Why am I having this incredible experience, but I'm not feeling completely fulfilled? And I quickly realized it's because I wasn't creating work for myself. I was Mm. creating work that was my client's brief or that was a vision of somebody else. Um, and so I began to do personal work. And so the series that you're talking about is actually one of the first projects I began to work on in 2015. Oh, wow. And I, I, I boiled it all the way down into what am I passionate about as an artist? And I realized one of the things I can't remove is I am African. That is a part of my identity. And I began asking the questions of, okay, um, yes, I'm African, but I've been, I've been exposed to the world. And so who am I? What does that make me? And then asking the questions of, you know, I'm a woman in a field that in Kenya was not viewed as um, very favorable to women or something. You know, if you're a woman, you'd want to do something else except what I was doing. Yeah. And I said, okay, so does that make me any less of a woman? And then looking at myself and realizing that, um, I think every woman struggles with how she looks. You know, I've never met a woman who says, I look fantastic, 100%, photograph me from any side. There's always women who are like, oh, today this is my better side, or today this is my better side. And, um, and, and, And realizing that as a woman, one of the things I wanted to speak into in my personal work was just the, the difficult journey every woman has to loving herself and affirming herself. And so with all those different themes, Kind of came up with this series that celebrates the different aspects of who I am as Tandiwe and by view of women and just um, the struggle we have in being women and, and the, the need for us to celebrate beauty because somehow culture yeah. always has a standard of beauty that is opposite from how we look. And so yeah. I came up with this that talks about all these different things. That's amazing. And just um, you're right when you talk about, you know, that black beauty and seeing standards and society um kind of projecting or saying this is the standard of beauty and it's always it's always contrary to how it looks so i really love that i think that's probably what, one of the things that caught me about your work um 
And so the next question I have for you is how do you define your practice? Because I see photography, I see a bit of collaging maybe of um, fabrics and different materials. So for you, has it always been this is photography or how would you say you define it? It's always been this is photography. I, I am a photographer, number one, like even beyond creating this series, I love photography so much. Yeah. Um, but I do, I think when, when I see an image in my head for the series, I recognize there's several stages it has to go through to get to that image. Mm. And so things like, for example, the clothing and the images I design, and then I work with local tailors in Nairobi to get it made. Um, oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and the eyewear, sometimes I make it by hand, by myself. If it's a bit more technical, I might work with, you know, a welder or somebody else. But all those are tools that I use to get to the final image that I see in my head and the final vision that mm. I have in my head. So I am a photographer. I think that's how I describe myself first and foremost. Okay. That's my chosen medium. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know you. I didn't know it was that detailed of you actually you're know, going through these fabrics and like making them. And... Yeah. That makes it. It's I'll awesome. ask another question about that later. <laughs> okay. That makes it more interesting. <laughs> okay, and then that now leads into material culture. I know the head tie is something that, like, again, different African cultures kind of share this, and so um, I was like, okay, this is interesting. But something I found that is profound about material culture, your series, is your quotes. You say, "Covering our heads to beautify ourselves." And then later you say it's the equivalent of a regal coronet that draws the viewer's gaze upwards in the same way a crown does for a queen. And it's so profound because I've seen, like, I see my mom tie this in Nigeria. Yoruba people will say gay label. Like, I see many different people tie this gay label. I've never heard it said that way before, you know? Covering our heads to be by ourselves is like a crown. Talk to me about how you came up with this idea and why this was a motive for you and why this is significant. I think this project has a special place in my heart because my mother wears a head wrap every day. So when she's in the house, you know, of course, you know, for events, they wear the, yeah. know, the big thing, yeah. you know, and, and in Africa, I'm sure Nigerians are the same. You can kind of get really big and wild. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do that for like weddings and special events, but on a daily basis, just in the house, she wear a very small head covering. Mm -hmm. And so I've grown up watching my mother cover her head. And I think tracking back to just beginning my journey about um, understanding my identity as a woman and just questioning things that our culture teaches us about beauty, what is beautiful, what is not. Mm -hmm. I want to observe um, daily practices we have, beauty practices we have in a new way. And I realized this is something very powerful about watching my mother cover her head. And generally across the continent of Africa, we have our own unique variations of covering our heads as a way of being more beautiful or, or beauty yeah. for ourselves. Like um, and beginning to ask what makes this beautiful? Why is it so beautiful? And, and maybe it looks amazing and beautiful, but for me, what I saw the beauty in this practice is it's literally every day watching my mother crown herself, just a physical mm. act, making this, this head wrap that she's either made or she's going to make. And, you know, putting it on her head is every day just crowning herself. And then she goes out and conquers her day doing the most ordinary things, you know, yeah. women go out and care for children, women go out to the office, but they have, they can step out in boldness because they have kind of placed this very empowering motion or done this very yeah. empowering motion before they face their day. And I just thought this is such a beautiful practice. And yeah, I had never seen it before. You know, it's one of those things, you go through life and then one day my eyes were opened and I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's been a <laughs> um, And so I wanted to do a series. So it's very close to my heart because it's inspired by my mother. And so I wanted to do a series that kind of just explored that. Of course, it's very me and I'm very big on taking very traditional practices, but showing them in a very modern way, because mm -hmm. that's what our generation is. You know, I wouldn't wear yeah. a head wrap the same way my mother does. And so if you notice in, in material culture, the head wraps are not very similar to the ones um, older women will wear. It's very yeah. much um, kind of a modern take on the head wrap, yeah. but it, it still has the same power as a woman crowning herself before she goes out to face the world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take that now. I'm just going to keep that in. That's actually really good. And it's true because I was thinking about this, this question that I wanted to ask you. 
And I remember that when we would go for parties in Nigeria, I see my mom, my aunties, and just other women, when they wear the gele, like the hair tie, the way they walk is different. It's like there's a certain awareness that I they mean, put on something, I, right? They know it gives them power. They know they look good. It gives them a boldness. Yeah. Beautiful thing. It's it's very beautiful to watch and see that seeing that transition of you see them in the house when they're just like doing things and then the moment they step out, it's just different. You yes. know? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. And, and, um, and is is it's a fact that like it's interesting that covering your head would give you that much power. You know, usually you think uncovering would give you yeah. that strength power. So for me it's very fascinating to see the act of just putting something on your head is what I don't know, switches on that magic in, in, in the women. And yeah, it's, it's very fascinating. And I'm glad you actually bring that up in your work. And I think just following on and talking about womanhood, I see you highlight African femininity. And I think you touched on this earlier, but seeing that you, the, the parts of African femininity that are seen as unpopular, you kind of bring them to light and you don't shy away from that. But also at the same time, you empower the parts that society like berates or mocks. So please talk to me about how you see that. Would you say African femininity, those are the words you used to do, like to, that you associate with your work and, you know, just, yeah, talk to me about that. I, I would say yes and no. It definitely is about African femininity because I live and work in Nairobi. Um, and so how I interact with beauty and femininity every day is definitely from that context. Mm -hmm. But I think on a bigger scale, it's about every woman. It doesn't matter what culture you belong in as a woman. There is just things your culture won't celebrate. There is always a struggle to come to love yourself when you, you are so different from what a culture says you should be. Um, I can give you some examples based out of Kenya, you know. Okay. So one of the things, and I think this might be prevalent in Nigeria as well, but one of the things that has been come has come to be viewed as beautiful is having long hair. Mm. And long hair is amazing. I, you know, I, I wish we had hair like that. But yeah. our hair is short and it is curly and it wants to stay like this all day. Yeah. And you know, and, and it, it brings questions like, so okay, what if my hair doesn't grow long and straight? Does that mean I'm not a beautiful woman? Mm, what yeah. my hair? Does that mean I'm not a beautiful woman? Who does that make me? Does it mean I'm less feminine? And mm. I really wanted to address these issues in my work and to celebrate that even that is beauty. In fact, that is a more realistic view of beauty for us in our context than it might be having long hair that reaches your waist because that's yeah. just not how it happens i'm sorry even even if culture says this is beautiful what mm -hmm. happens when what culture idealizes is so different from my reality yeah and i began to want to be part of a movement that creates images that a kenyan girl a ugandan girl a nigerian girl can look at and be like she has hair like mine and she's beautiful Mm -hmm. And I hope even beyond that, any woman would look and read the text behind the work and say, oh my gosh, you mean I don't have to be what my culture says to be beautiful. I'm beautiful just the way I am. So I think mm -hmm. at the core, this series began as a love letter to myself mm -hmm. to affirm the things I always struggled with about myself and being a woman. Um, and it's, it's a love letter to all women that, you know, it's okay if you look different from what your culture says. Um, yeah. There is beauty even in that, and it doesn't. Your beauty is not diminished hmm. by looking yeah. different. I think yeah. there's one. I like using African proverbs in my work, and mm -hmm. there's one proverb I love completely that says, "A diamond does not lose value due to lack of admiration." And I think at the core, that's what I want women to take from my work: that yeah. just because you don't look like you know everyone's stopping to look at you, doesn't mean you're not a diamond yeah exactly i read that i read in fact you know what i'm going to ask this question first because i'm going to ask something else but now that you've rested up i'm going to ask this question next because i was very fascinated that every time i looked at your pictures i saw an african proverb attached to it and so let me read some for the viewers you said the first one that i really liked that i also wanted to read you know so let me go to the next one when sleeping women when sleeping women wake they move mountains and then a woman's beauty is not hidden in her face. I, when I first read all of that, I was like, wow. 
because you know on one hand we talk about society and the kind of unrealistic standards they set beauty standards they set that we often don't fit in but at the same time these are african proverbs meaning that they are coming from our language and our belief on women so what happened where did we get this wrong but i like that you bring that in it's, it's almost like even the picture that we see now and the way that society sees now you're almost taking people back to be like okay let's let's think of where it starts right but talk to me a bit more about african proverbs and if they are the foundation for your work or if your photographs reinterpret the proverbs so um chinua chebe the mm. african author has a very good quote he says um proverbs are the palm oil with which pa- uh, words are eaten mm. and i think you know just my work is a photograph but the proverbs just tie in and kind of bring out the message very clearly that i'm trying to um speak about yeah. so for example the one that talks about a woman's beauty is not hidden in her face i think we have a culture in a society that is so obsessed with the physical and what you can see and yet have you ever interacted with a person and their personality is so beautiful it just yeah. magnifies how they look already yeah. and 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 just there's so much more to beauty than what we see and we live in a culture that is obsessed with the visual but there's so much more that encompasses what it means to be a woman what it means to be beautiful what it means to be a change maker in your society yeah. and i kind of want my work to to remind the viewer of that that you know women as you're looking at your identity and your beauty and your role it is so much more than what we can see there's so much that mm-hmm. is hidden and it's worth celebrating. Um but I begin with the pictures and then I usually find proverbs that tie well behind the messaging of a particular piece. So mm-hmm. every image that I create has a story. So even the objects that I use for, to make the accessories for example are selected because there's a story behind them and there is some principle or some observation yeah. or some struggle I am recording in my journey around beauty and womanhood that I want to draw the viewer's attention to. and the proverb helps do that because words sometimes can be very powerful and so the proverb helps drive that point home even beyond what you're seeing with your eyes and it just yeah. kind of brings it all together it's icing on the cake i think it's how yes. it <laughs> and again you think of it as that metaphor you you think the woman's the woman's beauty is not hidden in her face the proverbs do the same thing right it's a, you don't necessarily see words right so it's like this beautiful metaphor that like just carries on more more than a metaphor but you get what i mean that narrative just like carries on and i think it's it's been incredible as i've done this series to just realize how much wisdom there is in tradition and culture so mm-hmm. my interaction with my culture initially was yes i'm kenyan but i completely wanted to reject um all the traditional aspects we had in our culture because i thought that's boring that's old school you know we are more than we don't do that mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. but then realizing that there's some things about our cultures that can be very difficult and hurtful to us as women mm-hmm. but there's also some things that are beautiful about our culture and i think one of the things proverbs remind me is just how we have such a beautiful way of recording our wisdom proverbs are wisdom just in a short sentence yes um, and i really did want to celebrate that because there's some beautiful proverbs that really speak life to women and i wanted to share those that's amazing and i'm glad that you highlight that because Yes, I it's about time that you know we we actually say because oftentimes oh our society our culture you know they they don't respect women they don't but it's that's not the case you know something is broken somewhere and so yes. I I love the fact that you always bring that back up love the fact um and so moving back to the materials that you use in your work and this is I guess more so focusing on your camo series which I also love. I was always caught like every time I would scroll through and I see these pictures and I'm like they always they always have something that I wear is always very different. And I, t- I was like I don't even know what material this is until I started reading and I thought like oh you've used everything from sink strainers, ropes, ribbons, all of these things. So I have two questions here. What do they represent these materials and why why the eyes specifically? Why not any other feature? Um so yes I use everything from everywhere I am often shopping in my kitchen I walk by and I'm like oh that would make good eyewear <laughs> I'm going to my shop and like save it um but why why the eyes I think it's because I don't want the women in my images I don't want you to see 
tendiwe. If you know, I've never taken pictures of myself, but if I if I was a subject, I'd want you to look and say, oh, that's a picture of tendiwe. No, the women in the images are symbols. And so by covering their eyes, you're not focusing on the identity. I want you to see what they stand for, what they're saying about beauty. It's not about hmm. the individual. It's about what they're, they're symbolizing um, yeah. around beauty culture. So that's why I cover their eyes. Um, but then the second question was... What do they represent? Like these different objects, the okay. stories. You mentioned that earlier, right? About... So I think the core of my work is about identity and womanhood and beauty. But again, remember I said it's from a context of Kenya, which is where I grew up and where I've learned all these lessons and all these, yeah. quite all these struggles that I'm working through. Um, and so the objects are a way to celebrate my culture because of course Kenya is a third world country. There's a lot of poverty. And I wanted to speak into that, but not in a negative way. I never wanted to create work that talked about the problems of my, of, of you know, that everyone knows poverty and, mm -hmm. I think one of the beautiful things I have seen come out of poverty, which is often two words that don't go together, beauty and poverty, um, is mm. resourcefulness. Because people don't have, you know, the resources to buy something to solve problems. They just use mm -hmm. what they have and creatively problem solve. And I think that is an incredibly beautiful thing about Kenyan culture. Yeah. But I think as I reflected on that more and more, even on a deeper level, it's very easy to walk by an object and just say, that's just a salt shaker. And that's all it is. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing this work, I now walk by a salt shaker and I see so much more. I see potential. I see what it could be. It could be earrings. It could be, you know, I could make a crown from it. It could be glasses. Mm -hmm. And I see the design in my head. And I think every woman needs to look at herself like that. I think mm -hmm. it's very, we, as women, we easily dismiss ourselves and we say, oh, but I, you know, I'm not pretty enough or, oh, I'm just tendy wear, you know, mm -hmm. but if we look at ourselves in a new way with new eyes, there is so much more to us than what we yeah. initially think. Yeah. And I hope every woman, just like I look at these objects and I see these fantastic, sometimes crazy pieces of eyewear, that every woman can look at herself and see more mm -hmm. than just who she is. They, she can see how she is this beautiful combination of her experiences, her pain, her joy, and that just turns her into something so unique and it gives her a beauty that is indescribable. Exactly. And then the function of how then that translates to society. And in your case, you are giving us these amazing photographs and like this work to look at, but for viewers, I guess, and women knowing that even from then, there's so many places in society that you can actually affect positively. Back to like the different eyewear and you know, if you think, well, I'm not a sing trainer, well, okay, you have ropes. And if I'm not a ribbon, then okay, you know, there's, there's something else and there's always a place for for that, you know? Um, and I actually wanted to ask you, I, I skipped over this quote. You said, when you have little, you transform and reuse it. So I think you were just kind of talking about that right now. And I wondered if that was only in the context of the eyewear that you choose. That's like, because obviously we see you use different materials. So it's very easy to put that quote close to, to the eyewear. But I wonder if there's anything else in your work that, you know, that quote also represents or symbolizes. I think it would be, it's mostly in relation to the objects, but I think a little mm -hmm. bit about my story. Um, because I began photography so young, I was a very broke teenager, like every good teenager. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had to be very creative in, in, in how I would, you know, create images. Um, so I remember one of the ideas my mom gave me, and my mom is so creative. Um, I really, you know, I'd see all these magazine photo shoots and they had these backgrounds that were pure white. Yeah. And so my mom said, oh, why don't you use bed sheets to, you know, um, make a, a backdrop because I couldn't afford yeah. to buy the rolls that we use in studios. And so my first studio was bed sheets that I'd hang on the door and then, mm -hmm. you know, voila, I have this studio. Yeah. Um, I couldn't afford to buy lights um, to, you know, light the images. And so I came up with the idea of using foil paper that you kind of use for cooking. Ah, yeah. And I a big a big square of a box and then I covered it really carefully with this foil paper. And that's what I'd use as a reflector to like oh, shine light yeah. on the thing my models and so you know it's it's the objects but it's my story and it's a story of almost every kenyan you just creatively yeah. problem solve to get to where you need to get to exactly and i relate so much because i i just see myself in uni i see myself doing that right and it's like where i am maybe i have access to some things but maybe not even in the way that i imagine it and so it's like 
what do I have around me? I'm going to take what I have and I'm going to make it into something. And yeah. that's very, you, you say, you, you, you're you right when you say that that creates like this creative problem solving skills and these different solutions that even in our world today, when I see Africans doing things, I'm like, oh, wow, how did you think of this? Like, oh, how did you even come up? Like, when did you even sit? Oh, this is interesting, you know? And so I, I totally understand. I, I totally get what you're saying and I totally agree. Um, and I wish I had one more question to ask you because I'm enjoying this conversation. But I, I just want to thank you, Tandy Way, for speaking with me and for having this discussion. I've learned so much just looking at the images, but also just hearing you speak about them. I'm, I've, I've learned so much and I want to thank you um, for coming on here to talk to me. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And, oh. you know, um, I think I said I'm a photographer, but every image has a, a story behind it. And I would encourage, you know, whoever's looking at this and wants to get to know my work to actually go and read the stories because they're beautiful mm -hmm. stories that celebrate what it means to be a woman um, and just a journey of beauty. So, yeah. And they have amazing problems as well. So read the problems. Yes. <laughs> yes. And on that note, you can follow Tandy Wear at on Instagram at tandywear underscore real and then check the link in the description if you want to find out more about her work and keep up with our work because this is amazing work that i know it will feed your soul as it has fed mine so thank you everyone and i'll see you next time on curatorially speaking with Shai. bye then no no say we day we come night and day sister paved the way so i no hesitate brother tell me say make a no call Cause this is the day, yes this is the day